Hi, I'm Lisa Klein, part of Progeny's member care team. And welcome to part three of our three-part Progeny member education video on in vitro fertilization, or IVF. In this video, we will cover everything that happens after your retrieval, from developing and fertilizing embryos through the two-week wait and your pregnancy test. After a successful egg retrieval, it is time for the embryology lab to come to center stage and fertilize the eggs with sperm. Up until this point, this has been completely based on humans performing. The first human was the patient, the second human was the doctor. Now we're talking about laboratory science. And this is where I have a lot of fun as a reproductive endocrinologist because I actually get to see conception occur. Conception, where egg and sperm meet. Now, truth be told, back in the old days when people did in vitro fertilization or IVF, they used to take one egg and put a drop of sperm around it to allow for natural fertilization to occur. They actually, they called it insemination. I laughed to myself because there's nothing natural about any of this stuff because this has all been medically induced and it's occurring in a laboratory. But nowadays, we typically don't do insemination or natural fertilization because we want to use precision medicine. We want to take the opportunity to pick the best looking sperm possible and put that single sperm inside of a single egg. In fact, the smallest surgery known to man is this process. Single cell inside of another single cell. Now, to do this process, also known as ICSI, or intracytoplasmic sperm injection, ICSI, you have to have a very carefully and, and appropriately trained team. Together, to me, it's the most magical thing I get to witness in the laboratory. After fertilization occurs, the embryologists don't just sit back and relax. There's a lot going on behind the scenes. What's going to happen over the next three to seven days is that those embryos are going to be carefully nurtured and fed in an environment to mimic the natural human body. And the way we do that is by controlling the oxygen content to make sure that it mimics what's in the human body, the protein content, and to make sure that we're giving the amino acids that they need to go through those first phases. The first phase is called the anaerobic respiration, where the embryo doesn't need to have oxygen present. And in the second phase, the aerobic respiration, where there's a different number of metabolic steps that has to go through for development. At the end of those five to seven days, you have what's called a blastocyst. By the time we get to day five, six, or seven, we have grades. We know how these embryos look. How are they performed? And we have data. So quite often we can tell patients, we retrieved X number of eggs and X number were mature. Of the ones that were mature, this many fertilized. Of the ones that fertilized, this is how they looked on day three when they went through that first metabolic process. This is how they look on day five, six, and seven. Before treatment began, you would have discussed with your physician if you wanted to utilize pre-implantation genetic testing on your embryos. Pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy, or PGTA, is a great way to make sure you are transferring a chromosomally normal embryo, which will have a higher implantation rate, lower miscarriage rate, and greater outcome for pregnancy. PGTA is sometimes called CCS. It used to be called PGS, and it is covered under your progeny benefit. Going to IVF should not be taken lightly. Many patients think that it's a slam dunk. It's an automatic guaranteed pregnancy. But truth be told, if someone has a long-standing history of infertility, there's probably some underlying pathology that's been going on for a while, and something's going awry in the process. Sometimes we learn that despite having very good numbers, meaning egg count on ultrasound, anti-mullerian hormone on blood work, or a young age, or normal semen parameters, that by the time that these eggs and sperm make it to the laboratory, there's some intrinsic egg dysfunction or sperm dysfunction. Even though we can control as much as we can in the laboratory, there's some things that are out of our control. And those things are the genetics. In plain English, the most beautiful embryo can be chromosomally abnormal. And if that embryo is abnormal, that can lead to a child with disabilities, things like Down syndrome, for example, that's the common one that people know about, or it can lead to a terrible miscarriage. Patients often ask, my friend had four transfers done in another clinic and none of them stuck. Do you know why? 
And I always tell them no, because getting an embryo to stick or implant can be the uterus, which is where you're putting the embryo back, how you're putting the embryo back, the environment you're putting it back in, how you grow the lining of the patient. But more importantly is, what did those embryos look like? How did they perform? What was their chromosomal status? All these data points help us guide patients along their way. After the embryos develop and at least one is deemed viable, it is time to prepare the uterus for transfer. So after your retrieval, of course, the next question is, when am I going to have my transfer? Um, so ideally, we like to wait until we know that we have normal embryos to transfer, unless, of course, you're having a fresh transfer. Otherwise, you would contact us with your period, and we would talk about your protocol. We would either put you on a birth control pill um, to, allow, to allow us to have timing, um, a, a drug called Lupron, which also allows for timing and prevents ovulation. So we have complete control of preparing your lining for the transfer. Um, so depending on what the protocol is, we review that in detail with you, order your medications, again, make sure every consent is ready to go, um, and set you up for your transfer. Either before the IVF process goes through, the ovarian stimulation, or after retrieval is you assess the endometrial cavity by either putting fluid inside of the uterus to make sure that there's no lumps, bumps, or abnormalities, those are fibroids or polyps or irregular growths. You look at the lining to make sure that the lining is normal and regular. You make sure there's no fibroids around the lining that's changing the contours of the lining. And you also make sure that the fallopian tubes are clear. If you have fallopian tubes with fluid in them, which is called a hydrosalpinx, that that can significantly diminish your chance of a successful transfer because that fluid flows backwards into the cavity and is toxic to embryos. But once you assess the cavity and you're comfortable that you have a good uterus, you're good to go with the preparation of the lining. The preparation of the lining typically takes 10 to 14 days as well. We give patients medications to grow their lining in a very programmed and structured and reproducible fashion so that the thickness of the lining gets to an appropriate state and so that the histology or the cell type within there represents the environment that normally would be there when trying to get pregnant on your own. There's lots of ways to do an embryo transfer preparation cycle. If the patient has regular cycles, you can let them grow their lining on their own. And then after having spontaneous natural ovulation, you put back an embryo a couple days later that's at the correct stage. That's the natural cycle FET, which every patient always asks for. But not every patient's the right candidate for it because that patient may not make a lining that's thick enough in their own natural state. The next option that we can offer them is something called a programmed frozen embryo transfer or programmed FET. During this process, we give the patients medications in a very controlled and regimented fashion to grow their lining and to help grow it thick enough that it's appropriate for an embryo transfer. We then start synthetic progesterone. And what the progesterone does is it helps mature that lining to make it the right histology or cell type to welcome an embryo to let an embryo stick. All of the preparation, injections, monitoring, and lab work has been building up to this, the embryo transfer. On transfer day, once the doctor is ready and embryology is ready, they wheel the embryo back in an incubator, just like you see in the NICU or on TV. Um, it even has a little beeping noise, and they come into the room. Then they prepare the embryo, and you can see this all under the video. Um, so it's kind of cool that you're able to see all that. And then uh, obviously they make sure that we're identifying the right embryo to the right patient. At that point, the doctor then prepares um, you for the transfer. So similar to all the ultrasounds you've had done to get to this point, um, you will be doing an ultrasound guided transfer. So all doctors do an ultrasound guided um, to help know exactly where they're placing the embryo. So you'll be able to see that on the video when they're actually injecting the embryo. So that's a really nice point um, where you're involved with the transfer. It's kind of like starting off like a pap smear, right? So we place a speculum in the vagina and we visualize the cervix, which is the bottom of the uterus or the top of the vagina. And then through that very small pinpoint hole, we carefully introduce an embryo into the endometrial cavity or the lining of the uterus. 
A lot of patients ask us if they can go back to work after the transfer, and that's totally up to you. It's whatever you're comfortable with. Um, if this is your normal routine and you want to do that, that's completely fine. If you'd rather go home and veg on the couch and relax, that's fine too. Whatever's going to decrease stress is our, our best answer for you. When you think about IVF, you might think there's a greater chance of having twins or triplets even, but things have changed over the years. Fertility specialists or reproductive endocrinologists overwhelmingly agree that an elective single embryo transfer is the safest option for a healthy pregnancy. The Centers for Disease Control, who also regulates the IVF practices in America, and SART, both carefully state that one cycle should yield one baby. And that's the goal. In fact, our goal as clinicians is for one healthy baby at a time. After the transfer is the wait to find out if the embryo implanted in the uterus. This is commonly known as the two-week wait. After the transfer, the nurse will then review any do's and don'ts and what to expect during your two-week wait. Um, you will be encouraged to continue all medications and a normal life at that time. About nine days later, we do your blood work, um, and if you are pregnant, you will be four weeks pregnant. Once the transfer has happened, implantation has to occur. Implantation occurs over the next couple of hours to days. Some patients have some bleeding or spotting when implantation occurs, and most patients feel nothing. In fact, this is the most common question I get from patients. Doc, I had my transfer, I feel nothing. And I always tell them the same thing, great, because you shouldn't feel anything. You're not gonna feel instantly nauseous. You're not gonna feel instantly pregnant. You're not gonna hear angels singing right away. You're not gonna have bleeding right away. Everyone's a little bit different. But typically it takes about nine days after a frozen embryo transfer of a blastocyst, that day five, six, seven embryo, to confidently tell someone by blood work that they're pregnant. Another big question we get is, should I take a urine pregnancy test? Again, this is a personal choice. For me, I would say, let's wait until the morning of that nine days and it wouldn't hurt to take a urine pregnancy test because it almost could prepare you for good or bad news. Um, others like to take a test immediately following the transfer. So again, it's a personal choice, but our protocol is nine days, so we wouldn't check your blood work until nine days regardless of a positive pregnancy test. All of this has been building to the pregnancy test. Once they get the blood work back that says that they're pregnant, we then recheck that blood work 48 hours later to make sure that the beta HCG or the pregnancy hormones going up in an appropriate fashion. Of course, we also check the estrogen and the progesterone because those are two hormones that we can supplement back to the patient to help make sure that everything is appropriate and to make sure that their levels are appropriate to give them the best chances of success. From there, the patient's monitored after making sure their beta HCG is rising appropriately with an ultrasound around five to six weeks to confirm that the pregnancy is in the uterus, right? Every so often, IVF pregnancies can occur in the fallopian tube. That's called an ectopic pregnancy, and that's a life-threatening emergency, so we wanna make sure that the pregnancy is in the uterus. And then the patient is monitored at regular intervals to make sure it's a normally developing pregnancy. Here at CCRM, if you are positive, you are four weeks pregnant, depending on exactly what day we do your initial blood work. Our protocol then is to repeat the test two days later, and if all looks good, we repeat it again around five weeks. So at this point, we're looking at your beta HCG levels to make sure that they're rising about 66% every other day. Um, that stops, that stops starts to decrease around five weeks, so we're not looking at that as much. We want to make sure that the support you're on, the estrogen and the progesterone support, are adequate uh, for the pregnancy. So we're also looking at those levels. After your initial ultrasound at six weeks, we usually tell you to come back again around seven weeks if all looks good. At seven weeks, I always say make sure your partner's here because we're, we are looking for a heartbeat at that time. So if there is a nice strong heartbeat at seven Seven weeks, we'll bring you back again at eight weeks, and then we're talking about discharge. So discharge is a great word because that means we're also weaning you off your medications at that point as well. Once you're completely weaned off your medications, you're following up with your OBGYN, usually around nine to ten weeks of pregnancy, depending on their specific practice. Quite often patients say to me, 
I did IVF, that means I'm high risk, right? And the answer is no. Humans are designed to carry one pregnancy at time to term. So there's no reason to think that just because you need a little help getting a kickstart, that everything's gonna go bad from there. So we frequently tell patients are, no, you're normal. It's okay to be pregnant, and you're pregnant just like everybody else. And there's no scarlet eye that you have to wear on your shirt when you get to the hospital for everyone to know that this is an IVF pregnancy. The last thing to know is that according to the American Institute of Ultrasound Medicine, or AIUM, every IVF pregnancy in America should be monitored with a fetal echocardiogram or a special ultrasound done around the 20th week or mid gestation of that pregnancy just to make sure there's no cardiac side effects that are there. But other than that, once you're pregnant with IVF, you're like everybody else because eventually we pull away the hormones and you're off on your own. Whether your result is negative or positive, it's important that you understand the support team you had during your journey is still with you. So of course, not every end result is gonna be positive. When we do have negative pregnancies, our doctors do reach out to the patient that day um, and they are talking about next step. So I think that's just great support um, to know that we are a team here and we're with you on this journey. What's amazing about my job and what I love about my job the emails, the phone calls, the pictures, the fact that we help patients achieve their goals, which really are not even goals, they're dreams, is the most amazing part of my job. And so I feel really lucky to have this job. We do get thank you messages and we have a lot of patients who come back with their, with their babies. And for me, because CCRM, we're like a family here and the doctors make us feel like we are a team and it is a team effort to make this baby. Um, it's even more special for me because when the baby comes and I'm like, oh my gosh, and then the science behind it, it's just a, it's a lot of emotions when someone brings their baby back in because it's like, oh my God, we did this together. Oh, they're so cute. Oh, this is overwhelming. Oh, congratulations. Like, it's just a lot that goes into that. So it makes me feel good. Being an IVF nurse is very, very stressful as we're dealing with two of the most important things in people's lives, their money and, and children or potential children. So when we see patients come back with success and babies and happy and just so grateful and thankful for what we could help them do and get to, it's the reason why we stay here and why we do what we do. Um, so that's really my favorite part of the job is getting pictures of babies or Instagram stories of babies and um, it just makes me realize like this is why I'm here. We hope you found this three-part member education video on the process of in vitro fertilization helpful. Please don't hesitate to reach out directly to your patient care advocate if you have any questions or concerns about your upcoming treatment. And remember, you can always get more information at progeny.com slash education. I'm Melissa Klein, and on behalf of your entire Progeny family, we look forward to helping you along your journey.